appreciate your time and uh, don't want to waste any more of it by starting any later. Um, as as a reminder, this is um, case reviews from our cases and I welcome any questions. Um, any questions or any thoughts about uh, what your your take of any part of the scenarios are since they're all real cases. Uh, moving forward. So this information, as as always, is confidential and privileged. Do not share it with anyone other than those that are um, in a need to know basis, which is for our purposes, education within the EMS system. All right, and then let me see if I can uh, mark if you are able to see if there's any comments in between cases. I'll take a moment to make sure that we address any of them. Yep, I shall. All right. Fantastic. Um, so this month's case reviews is kind of themed, didn't really intentionally be, um, become themed, but uh, it's going to be chest pain and the different faces of chest pain. It might be based off of we started to review KPIs for chest pain, and that might be a little bit about why that's a chest pain themed. And then all of these images were not of the patients, um, FYI, as you can tell that they're um, proprietary. Anyways, so the first case is a 45 year old male who presented or called 911 for chest pain. Uh, EMS had proper PPE. The patient was awake and he had an open airway that was protecting. Um, he had no evidence of any compromise to his circulation. Vital signs were obtained pretty quickly upon assessment of the patient, noted to be within normal limits. His past medical history is uh, coronary artery disease, where he had a stent place, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, end stage renal disease, and neuropathy. Uh, the history that was documented in the, elect in the um, provider's electronic medical record talked about a very stressed scene dynamic between the patient and his significant other. The patient had chest pain that increased with movement, sitting up, and inspiration, although the patient was, from documentation, disinterested in providing any additional details such as onset, description or other features of it. He did acknowledge that he had taken four of his nitroglycerins, but was disinterested again to say when he took it, how much, how free, how quickly he took the four doses and if it had any effect on his chest pain. So this is a little bit about the treatment and as a reminder, bolded, bolded numbers is patient contact, transport, which I forgot to remove that transport, I apologize. And the last bolded is arrival at the hospital. So I did document, I did write a little bit about what EMS had documented. Um, when they arrived to the, the private residence, the wife was outside waving her hands, appeared visibly upset. When they got into the patient's house, um, they asked EM, the EMS asked the patient questions, which the wife uh, promptly started answering all the questions. There was a little a statement within our documentation that stated that the questions needed to be asked of the patient so that they can assess his status and um, also his history. So they were able to get a 12 lead pretty quickly, again, within initial patient contact, placed a line, checked a glucose, and initiated transport within six minutes, and also uh, administered aspirin full dose. Any of the aspirin for the future cases is all full dose unless otherwise indicated. Got another 12 lead. Um, I should mention also in the upper right hand corner that the patient did not want to put his feet on the bed. Um, he wanted them to dangle on the side. The crews documented that they explained to the patient they were unable to lock the bed properly with his feet dangling. So he eventually agreed to put his feet up on the bed, but refused a chest strap. I think in further, further uh, assessment that he didn't want a chest strap because of a uh, concern for injury to his sternum since he had a previous sternotomy. And then it sounds like once they initiated transport, the patient stopped talking to them, not because he was unconscious, but just because he was upset and didn't want to uh, answer any more questions. At some point during his transport, 
uh, I don't know if it was with fentanyl or not with fentanyl, but he had reported that this this black on the right upper is what was documented in the chart, uh, relates that he's having a heart attack and his frustration with the EMS crew. Uh, they also document that EMS advised patient that there's no EKG findings indicating an acute MI at this time. They got him to Peace Health Southwest, where I actually took care of this gentleman. And when they arrived at the ambulance bay, the wife met them outside of their ambulance and apparently was very aggressive verbally telling EMS to per, and I think, well, we'll talk about it later. They documented exactly the communication that the wife had uh, related to EMS, which I think as long as it's not paraphrasing and it's quote, quotes, that's appropriate. The first 12 lead is here. There's, it looks like first degree heart block, He's got an uh, incomplete left bundle. It looks like QA is antibodies, but nothing that really speaks out to me about that he's having any evidence of a STEMI or ST elevation MI. And then that repeat EKG that they obtained was largely unchanged. You might look at his T waves and kind of question about if he might be hyperkalemic. Uh, if I remember correctly, he was due for dialysis that day, I believe. So after review of our pre-hospital care and documentation, the crews did a great job of getting a 12 lead within our goal of less than 10 minutes. They got it from point zero. They continued with the care that was indicated for the patient's chief complaint. Um, despite, I thought they were very very professional despite the, at least documentation wise, and when I received the sign out from the, um, or the EMS report from the crews, they were very professional despite was, which was obviously a very difficult dynamic between the patient and his wife. They documented all of the interaction, um, not in their perception, but of what actually happened and what was actually uh, communicated to the patient. The room for improvement areas that I think I think that documenting that the patient wasn't having an MI because of no evidence of one on the 12 lead is a bit, it might be, a, it is a bit misleading, especially because that is not going to identify all acute MI or acute coronary syndromes or MIs. So uh, being careful about giving patients information that either gives them a false expectation or a false perception of what we're able to provide them definitively. So in the emergency room, the patient and his wife continue to be difficult that the patient refused to answer questions. He insisted that his wife answer. He refused to get into the hospital bed and sat in the chair next to the bed, um, working and trying to help him and meet him where he was asking to be met. We left him in the chair next to the bed. His wife continued to communicate his needs, although I am, he did he did communicate when when pressed. His EKG was repeated. There was no evidence of ST elevation and his initial troponin came back elevated more so than his previous uh, tro troponin enzyme uh, levels were in the past. Based off of him, his presentation of worsening chest pain from his baseline chest pain and an elevated troponin, we started, a, we started treatment for either an instemi or unstable angina elevated troponin, it'd be more of an instemi, a non-ST elevation MI. The wife continued to plead with the nurse to get more pain meds because of how much pain that his, her husband was reportedly in, uh, but the nurse had stopped giving it to him because he was sleeping every time she would re reassess him to wake him up to ask him his pain uh, levels, and then noted that he was more lethargic when he first presented and that his glucose was in the 30s and that the patient had just taken his insulin despite um, being in the hospital. He ended up being admitted. Uh, initially, his treatment was going to be just anticoagulation with heparin, but because his, of his heart enzymes continuing to rise, he did undergo a heart cath, which showed that he had 100% occlusion of chronic occlusion of his LED circumflex and RCA. So his his um, 
his uh, collateral circulation perfusing his heart and that despite his significant coronary artery disease, he wasn't a candidate for anything more aggressive other than medical management and to stop smoking. Um, he was discharged on hospital day four. So I thought this would be a good time to talk about acute coronary syndrome and the things that we can tell patients both in the pre-hospital setting and in the hospital setting and uh, just have a better understanding for all of us in the event that we don't recognize that there are more than one type of acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome, you can think of it as it falling under the um, umbrella of coronary artery disease. Um, when it becomes an acute emergent issue, it's ACS. So it's a sudden reduced blood flow to the heart and it's dependent on the location, the length of time, and the amount of damage. As for unstable angina, that's when a patient has new symptoms or a change from their anginal symptoms or chronic ch uh, chest pain symptoms. So either new symptoms or, or change in their chronic angina. And then change in their chronic angina might be that it occurs more frequently, it occurs more easily for them, or it occurs at rest for them they feel like the symptoms are more severe or that they last longer. So these unstable angina is not going to necessarily, sometimes you might see like maybe well in sign, um, but you're really not gonna see any ST changes on the EKG. It's gonna be based off of history. And at this point with unstable angina, you wouldn't necessarily see an elevated troponin unless it progresses to an acute myocardial infarction. So those patients that are presenting with chest pain without EKG changes, they may be at risk of having an MI, especially if it's a difference in their in their chronic presentation. Um, so in STEMIs, these are myocardial infarctions without ST changes in the EKG. These will be patients that will have an elevated troponin or chemical enzyme markers. They will have either partial or temporary occlusion to their coronary arteries in that the extent of the damage is usually relatively small in comparison to STEMIs, so you don't see those ST changes on the EKG. And then STEMIs, these are MIs or myocardial infarctions that are abrupt and prolonged blocking blood supply to the heart. It affects large areas of the heart, which leads to EKG changes, and there will be an elevation in their cardiac chemical um, uh, markers, their troponin. So in summary, unstable angina, EKG changes not present, likely not elevated troponin. In STEMI, no EKG changes, troponin's elevated. STEMI, EKG changes, and troponin's elevated. So of these three concerning presentations for chest pain or chest pain equivalent, only one of them will be identified by 12-lead EKG. So reviewing our uh, protocols for chest pain, ACS, Cruz did a good job. They monitored his SpO2. They got a 12 lead, a 12 lead in an expedited fashion. They gave him aspirin. His blood pressure was, um, if I remember, actually, they chose to hold on his blood pressure, um, his nitroglycerin, because of the four nitros that he had previously received, which I think is reasonable, especially since the patient was unwilling to talk about um, if it changed anything, and they had given him some fentanyl for his discomfort as well. Anybody have any questions or thoughts about case one? No comments in the section either, Jackie. Okay. All right. So then we'll go on to case two. Just looking at my notes over here. All right, so case two, dispatched to a 74 year old for dizziness. Uh, PPE was appropriate. The patient uh, was awake, airway was open, but as for pulse, it was noted that, or as for circulation that Later on, they document that the patient was diaphoretic, ashen in appearance, so initially maybe potentially okay. Vital signs were obtained, as you see, maybe a little bit on the soft end of um, blood pressure, systolic blood pressures, and the patient has a past medical history of a stroke, back pain, alcohol consumption or use or misuse, hypertension, and reactive airway disease. 
the history of the present illness was that the patient was witnessed to have a loss of consciousness and crashed her scooter, um, her motorized power scooter. And she reported that she had a um, no loss of consciousness, although it was reported that there was by the witness and that the patient was incontinent of urine, but she she refuted that she was incontinent of urine. So kind of looking like she had a full sinkable versus loss of consciousness. EMS quickly assessed the patient for um, evidence of a stroke and they noted that she was diaphoretic, pale and dusky. Her initial vital signs are as you see in was, which was present on the previous, um, the previous uh, slide. An IV was established. A little bit of time later, the patient got a 12 lead, which is present here. The 12 lead was interpreted as possible STEMI with ST elevation in the inferior leads. And also it looks like in the lateral leads, at least V5, with a right axis deviation. So based off of that 12 lead, they got a glucose and they started the patient for transport to Peace Health for possible STEMI. They gave her aspirin, they repeated her 12 lead, and they repeated her vital signs and arrived to the hospital. Um, let me just make sure I didn't forget anything in this. Oh, the witness that was present, my understanding is that the patient after her crash of her power scooter had um, was assisted into the lobby of her residence. And I don't know if this was a, um, it sounds like it was someone who knew her because they said that she wasn't acting herself and that she was slower to answer questions and appeared to be pretty lethargic. So after just reviewing the pre-hospital side of things, uh, obtain, obtain an obtainment of getting a 12 lead with a patient that's had a syncable episode, that's dizzy, that skin skin appears to be shocky, especially in an elderly patient, uh, is a good idea. They did do serial 12 leads, especially given the initial concerning 12 lead. They did a neuro exam. They checked for other possible causes for her uh, not acting quite right by checking her glucose, and they recognized that she was sick. Now, where we could do better, an earlier 12 lead. The first 12 lead was obtained, looks like 14 minutes after patient contact, that the patient was lethargic and altered. Uh, we documented a GCS of 15, maybe maybe 14, and should she have spinal precautions, kind of speak to the assessment regarding her falling off her power scooter. Later in the hospital encounter paperwork, it indicated that the patient had hit a wall or potentially turned a corner um, and caught her wheel on something and fell off of her power scooter that way. So maybe a little bit more details of if you needed to do spinal precautions, especially because of the change in mental status. And that although the patient was identified um, correctly as being sick, vital signs were 17 minutes apart. So maybe more frequent in your in what you consider um, a critically ill patient. And then a question to premature closure. Uh, the patient had a syncopal episode, completed dizziness, but there are other causes that we should look at besides the initial finding of the 12 lead. And then if giving aspirin, the importance of making sure that it's not only does the patient meet the indications, but they don't have any contraindications to getting aspirin. So asking about hematemesis or melana or hematochesia. So in the emergency room, the ER doc had consulted cardiology pretty quickly. I don't believe that they had called it um, a STEMI based off of pre-hospital, but I, that was only based off of the ER doc's note. So I'm not sure if they did go ahead and activate um, the STEMI, but Cardiology was consulted. They looked at an old EKG, and apparently this patient has what appears to be ST elevation or inferior leads that have not been related to a STEMI, so just her baseline. Kind of the nice uh, touch of the emergency room or the hospitals that we can look at old 12 leads. During her ER encounter, she developed hypotension, noted to have systolic blood pressures in the 80s, and that she had coffee ground emesis associated with her hypotension, concerning for a possible GI bleed. 
she was started on protonics. They weren't sure about how frequent her alcohol consumption was. Uh, she reported that she hadn't drank in over a year. They started her on emergency blood transfusions with two units of red blood cells and two units of platelets based off of the um, the aspirin that she received and also the potential for liver disease uh, affecting her coagulation. They started her on ceftriaxone to prevent possible infection, given that they expected to scope her to evaluate where her GI bleed was occurring and given her concern for a liver disease. Um, and then she also got octreotide. They placed a central line in the emergency room and consulted GI. She had a, a scope done, which showed a large duodenal ulcer that was uh, actively bleeding. She um, had that banded and she also had what later was what what later was determined as a type two MI, where they thought that it was demand related from her GI bleed um, and acute blood loss anemia. She was discharged on hospital day four after stabilization from her her GI bleed and her uh, um, her hemorrhagic shock. Interestingly, she re represented one day later. For a very similar presentation, she syncopied off of her power scooter again, was found on the ground surrounded by dark blood, um, presumably lower GI bleed, uh, came back scoped and uh, got more blood and banded again. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about gastrointestinal bleeding. The difference between upper and lower GI bleed is anatomical. It's where the ligament of trites is. This image on the right hand side, the green um, muscle fiber is supposed to represent the ligament of trites. So it's going to be like esophagus, uh, stomach, duodenum, and then anything distal, the duodenum at the, from the ligament of trites is considered a lower GI bleed. It's not necessarily 100%, um, but usually upper GI bleeds are going to present with hematemesis or coffee ground and, uh, emesis. And that's that dark, tarry stool that's really foul smelling for those of you guys that have uh, have encountered a patient like that. And then lower GI bleeds tend to be more bright red blood or hematochesia. The differential diagnosis for a GI bleed can be anywhere from Mallory Weiss tears to um, to esophageal varices to ulcers to uh, Malig malignancies to erosions from a separate area into the GI, um, the GI uh, like intestine. So it can be it can be more than just a straightforward ulcer uh, as well, and then potentially the risk of perforation from the ulcer ulcerating through the wall of the um, organ. Upper GI bleeds are more common than lower. Bleeds uh, occurring about twice as often, and then lower GI bleeds increases in presentation or um, existence in anyone who is advanced age, or and especially if they're male. Treatment is going to be sometimes it really is dependent on how sick the patient is, um, if they're showing evidence of shock or infection. But usually, it's proton pump inhibitors. Um, decreasing acid production, and if it's severe transfusing blood, banding, more aggressive therapies, and worst case scenario would be if like a patient presented with an upper GI bleed that they were unable to control bleeding, that they may um, get a, a Minnesota tube placed. Uh, for those that have never seen one, uh, you can Google Minnesota tube. It's pretty barbaric, and although they train about it, I personally haven't used any. I don't know if any of the other docs that are on this have. So aspirin in a GI bleed and why we really want to be careful about making sure our patients do not have a contraindication for administration. So aspirin is a NSAID and its mechanism of action is that it acetylates a serine residue on COX-1 and COX-1 is what we're talking about with platelets. COX-2 it, it does as well, but that's for another, um, another indication. And that it leaves the active site um, ir irreversibly inhibited, and that is for the duration of the platelet's lifespan. So that's usually about seven to ten days. And the only and so that you know, in re recollection of our anatomy and physiology and uh, pathology stuff class or information is that 
your platelets are necessary to be activated to form a um, kind of a think of it as like a plug and to try to control the bleeding. So if we give aspirin, we effectively inhibit the the uh, ability for the platelets to do their job. Um, so it's almost in some ways like giving them thrombolytic. Um, and that if a patient does have either aspirin on board from from medical provider or from the patient's own doing, we can always give them a, a platelet transfusion to introduce new platelets that are not irreversibly inhibited. And then, and lastly, in this case, that we would go over our syncope protocol. So, talking briefly about the definition and then identifying a patient that has. Um, had a syncopal episode and evaluating for other etiologies for their syncope, such as what these, this crew did, looking for any neurological abnormalities and checking for altered mental status, also checking a blood glucose. And then they managed the rest of the patient's condition with the treatment as indicated um, on our uh, protocol. And that, yeah, I don't think I have much more to say about that case. Anyone have any questions, concerns, thoughts, things you would do differently, things you always do, things you don't do? All right. Moving on to case three. What are we doing on time? All right. So EMS presents for evaluation of a 52-year-old male with chest pain. PPE on scene was appropriate. The patient is awake. His airway is open. He's protecting. Um, he doesn't have any active bleeding, but he is pale, cold, and diaphoretic in appearance. Vital signs are notable for hypertension at 185 over 105 and tachypnea at 22 with a normal room air set. His past medical history is erectile dysfunction and GERD. Um, EMS did document that the patient was a former nurse, so it makes it a little bit more potentially concerning and credible for the presentation of chest pain, especially with the skin findings. The patient had reported that he had progressively severe chest pain that's lasting for approximately 30 minutes. He had one episode of vomiting and that EMS specifically document in their review of systems that the patient does not have any blood in his emesis or his stool. First, set, first, initial, or first part of care was getting a set of vital signs. Second, two minutes, 12 lead. Um, three minutes later, he gets a full dose aspirin. And based off of his EKG, he's activated as a STEMI alert. And it's this EKG. So they identify what might be anteroseptal ST changes or septal ST changes um, and maybe what might be some depression in the inferior leads. They divert to a manual because Peace Health is on critical care divert, give him um, some fentanyl. They recheck his blood pressure, which is still hypertensive, um, no longer tachypnic. He got a 12 lead repeated, which is this, hold on, this image. So this 12 lead repeated doesn't show the ST changes that was noted in the previous 12 lead. So from 10 minutes later, those ST changes have markedly changed, but they continue to go towards Peace Health, which is appropriate. He gets um, anti-emetics, he gets a second line, and he also gets additional um, fentanyl. They note that after medical management, the patient's skin improves and that they did not give nitroglycerin because they recognize that the patient is on Viagra. Apologize for that. There you go. So in review of the pre-hospital side of things, I thought the documentation was really good. I thought the care was great. They met all of the necessary checkpoints um, that would be indicated for chest pain and then for STEMI, and they did it all in a timely fashion. The destination uh, is appropriate given that um, Peace Health is on uh, critical care divert, 
it may be worth me being new it may be worth and i don't know if you guys already have um this all worked out but if if uh from my understanding here at peace health we're almost never on divert for uh, certain specific things like um, trauma or stroke or cardiac or STEMI uh, cath lab. So I'm not sure if this crew contacted Peace Health to confirm that they would not be able to accept them or not. But otherwise, I think the destination for a divert status for that time when they had this patient was appropriate and that they got serial 12 leads on the patient. And then as for room for improvement, I really don't have any other ideas for room for improvement. How about anyone else, either physician or um, EMS crews? Any other thoughts? Maybe um, can any, if, is Dr. Whitmer on? Or maybe Mark or any of our um, leadership at EM, with EMS, would it be appropriate to contact Peace Health to make sure that they would not accept this patient for the cath lab, even if they're on quick care divert. So Jackie, yeah, that's um, um, that's a that's a QA issue from from our standpoint is to find out why they were on divert because typically Peace Health would take this patient. Um, I, and I don't know the circumstance. I don't know the circumstance behind this particular particular divert. I know this is something that Dr. Whitwer is working very closely with administration at um, Peace Health about, about not going on divert. Um, yeah. Often, well not oftentimes, but sometimes this will happen if the cath labs are full and they don't have a team to actually respond in a timely manner. Uh, depends on the condition of the patient, however, um, and whether or not that cath lab can empty um, fairly quickly or, or where they are in the particular procedure. But as a general rule, no, Peace Health does not go on divert for STEMI like that. Um, would it but be this is something that we'll look at. Okay, would it be worthwhile for EMS to still contact Peace Health to see if they would take them or just just until further notice go to uh, absolutely appropriate. absolutely no this is a this this was a I do know this was a notification to EMS that they were on divert mm -hmm. so, okay yeah you still consult definitely still consult with Peace Health um, prior to making that determination all right thank you Mark so the patient was transported to Emmanuel, went to the cath lab, and thanks to Dr. Mock, um, was able to get some follow-up for you guys. There, His coronary cath was actually clean. There was no evidence of any um, significant stenosis. They thought that his EKG changes and his presenting symptoms was due to coronary vasospasms. Um, and after his admission was discharged, he presented shortly after that admission, again, for chest pain and found to have an elevated troponin. They think that his working diagnosis is that he has myopericarditis, either from a viral infection, but he was also um, tested as syphilis antibody positive. So he's on colchizine for the next three months. His, at least virus wise, he's not COVID positive. All right. So not much learning points to go over other than just reviewing our protocol. Uh, we talked about ACS in the first one, so um, I just added the additional STEMI part of our protocol. So anybody who's got active chest pain that's less than 12 hours, um, this is what meets the criteria for a STEMI um, activation. Uh, 12 lead EKG with ST elevation in at least two contiguous leads. You know, what I would say is that if the patient has chest pain for more than 12 hours and your EKG is concerning, concerning for a STEMI, I would, uh, I would, I would personally err on that. I'm concerned for a STEMI and contact, um, contact Peace Health to let them know that, yes, it might be over 12 hours, but still concerning. And that no left bundle branch or paste rhythm is present. Uh, perfect. And if you see evidence of an inferior MI, you'll want to evaluate V3 and V4R for um, concern for a right-sided MI. All right, any ca uh, questions about case three? None, nobody has any thoughts, questions? It's okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. Just a quick question, and I'm sorry, I might have gotten them confused. Was this that was the case where nitro wasn't given because he was on a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. All right, so we'll move on to case four if nobody else has any thoughts to contribute. So case four was a 39 year old male that called 911 for chest pain. PPE was appropriate and above um, necessary measures needed. Uh, his primary survey was that he was awake, his airway was open and protecting, and that he had a pulse that was present, although he was very diaphoretic. Uh, first set of vital signs occurred about 14 minutes after patient contact, notable for bradycardia at 51, otherwise tachypnea um, with, a, with a rate of 24. No SpO2 was initially recorded for this assessment, so that's why it's not in there. Always good, especially if your vital sign, your respiratory rate is abnormal to have an SpO2 to make sure it's not from um, hypoxia. Past medical history, none was reported uh, in that the patient had a sudden onset of chest pain. Well, I believe he was in the kitchen. He was um, had one episode of vomiting, was diaphoretic, and had some back pain. He was very um, uncomfortable writhing around in that during his pre-hospital encounter, he developed uh, rib pain and felt dizzy. And when I say rib pain, I'd say kind of like posterior costal um, rib cage, I guess, or more maybe back pain. So from initial patient contact, I'm not sure what the dynamics were, but about 11 minutes later, um, a peripheral IV was established and uh, a set of vital signs were obtained. His blood glucose was noted to be um, elevated at 208 and he was given a full dose aspirin. He had uh, one night and for transport. He had a 12 lead obtained after um, after leaving the scene and they repeated his 12 lead. Oh, so here's his first 12 lead. A lot of uh, motion artifact, but uh, otherwise some bradycardia, no clear evidence of any cardiac abnormalities. And then they repeated it um, shortly afterwards to confirm that there wasn't any evolving findings um, instead of pulling it up right this moment, I'll go through this list and then I'll pull it up so we can uh, not have to go back to the same images again. They repeated a set of vital signs, noting that they were really unchanged. He received fentanyl for his pain. Another set of vital signs, another, or actually, yeah, another dose of nitroglycerin and another fentanyl and arrived on um, to Peace Health as a code three, actually. So important to recognize that they were concerned about his pre presentation and that they thought that getting him to the hospital in an expedited manner was the most appropriate, which um, I would agree. Uh, this is a patient that was, uh, I was involved in their care as well. Um, but interestingly, the pre-hospital documentation, uh, primary, primary um, impression was chest pain and secondary impression was um, possible Aneur um, aortic aneurysm. So based off of that, I thought that pre-hospital care was good in the sense that their serial 12 leads were obtained, um, that they recognized the patient as to be sick appropriately and got him to the definitive care. Um, he also, where we can improve is that for a patient that complained of chest pain, the time to get the first chest pain was longer than I then would be ideal. So it looks like we're looking at 14, 19 minutes for the first 12 lead. And that if, um, our, if you are dealing with a patient that you're worried about might have a vascular emergency, such as an aneurysm, you can hold the anticoagulation and document that in your, in your narrative about why you didn't give it. Um, it may have been given because looking at this timeline that the aspirin was given pretty early on within the first four minutes of presentation. And it may have been more clear later that it looked like some kind of aortic abnormality. So ideally having 
a set of vital signs, doing your primary survey and getting a 12 lead with a patient with chest pain or what you think is going to be a chest pain equivalent concerning for ACS, we should be getting 12 leads. And, and honestly, 12 leads are the ones that are time dependent as although aspirin does sh have benefit to help in reduction of mort morbidity and mortality there, um, it's, you know, during your transport or your encounter, giving aspirin is, is fine. There's no time recommendations of getting it in the first five minutes or in the, in the 20 minutes from initial contact, at least for our measures or our um, QA process. So in the emergency room, the patient presented with chest pain, shortness of breath, left shoulder and back pain, uh, 12 liter was repeated. There was no ST elevation. He was writhing around in the bed. He was diaphoretic. He was pale. Um, bilateral upper extremities, systolic blood pressures were in the 120s. He was never hypertensive for us. He was never hypertensive for the pre-hospital crews. He had bilateral femoral pulses that were symmetric as well. He had um, significant pain that was out of proportion to what he was talking about. Uh, he ended up having a bedside echocardiogram uh, to evaluate his heart function given his presentation, which was concerning for dilation of the aorta as well as um, a dissection flap. So he was having a aortic dissection um, based off of bedside ultrasound. He also, uh, the dissection went proximal enough of his aorta, of his uh, ascending aorta that it actually impaired the blood flow to the coronary arteries and it also led to a pericardial effusion. So we sent him to the CT scanner for a CT angio of his aorta and he actually ended up having a Stanford type type A dissection that extended from the root of his aorta all the way down to his iliacs, um, impairing the blood flow to his left kidney, which is probably why he had left flank pain, and also impairing the blood flow to his gut or his mesentery. So he um, was quickly contacted, or we quickly contacted cardiothoracic surgery based off of his injury or his uh, patho pathology. Um, he management for which we'll talk about actually in a few slides. I won't talk about it right here, but he um, had his hemodynamics optimized, a central line placed and sent quickly over to OHSU um, post haste because of the concern for um, mortality uh, being quite high given the extent of his dissection. At um, OHSU, he underwent an anti-grade stent deployment. He did fantastic. Uh, they think that he has some kind of congenital connective tissue disorder that that predisposed him to the to this dissection. I looked him up just before our lecture here. He's six weeks post um, surgical intervention, doing fantastic. So a little education about aortic dissections um, review for those that already have a pretty good comprehension about it. So the incidence of aortic dissections is five to 30 cases per 1 million per people per year. So what that means is it's pretty rare, not the rarest, but not as frequent as DVTs or heart attacks. Uh, black individuals or black patients are more likely to have a dissection than white. Um, male, there's a male predominance over female three to one in that 75% of dissections occur in patients um, age between 40 and 70. If you remember correctly, this was a 39 year old who was previously healthy, not just by um, not by the fact that he never sees a primary care provider um, and you know smokes and is obese. He he just doesn't didn't see a primary care provider and and was what looked like healthy um, externally. Uh, so the pathophysiology is that there's three layers of the um, of the aorta and that the innermost layer gets a tear or um, a tear that allows blood to enter it through that intimal tear and allows blood to dissect out those layers um, creating a false lumen and there the image on the right here shows you the the grading or the types of um, aortic dissections in that they are separated by stanford classification and debakey classification I find that most people refer, at least in emergency medicine, refer to them as Stanford classification. So type A dissections involve the ascending aorta, and that's if you're trying to look at this image and say, 
what's going on with the first two images, it starts at the ascending aorta. And um, type B dissections involve the descending aorta. So that's what the two images show you on the right hand side. This patient had a type A dissection that came off of the proximal aortic root, ascending aortic root, and went down all the way to his iliacs. And that the mortality of this condition is up to 30%. Oftentimes, um, we only find this in autopsy. So aortic dissections, um, they may present with a multitude of um, symptoms or physical exam findings. And I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of talk a little bit about that in hopes that we can recognize this and have pro appropriate suspicion, just like this, this pre-hospital crew did. They were concerned about his aorta. So the pain is usually acute in 85% of the patients. And if it's an ascending aortic dissection, they typically have more traditional chest pain, anterior chest, um, where descending uh, dissections will have back pain or abdominal pain. The scary part is that up to 15% will have no pain whatsoever. They may have jaw or neck pain. They may be short of breath. There may be, there may be some vital sign, vital sign abnormalities. And you can kind of think of those vital sign abnormalities as either that they have an ascending aortic arch tear that is all the way to the aortic valve and now is leading them into aortic regurgitation. So they have hypotension, they might be tachypneic, they might be tachycardic, or that their, um, their body recognizes that they're not perfusing appropriately, so their body's sympathetic um, nervous system kicks in and get, makes them more hypertensive. So you can have both variations. There may be pulse deficits present up to 31% of the time. Um, so it's not it's not even half the time. Um, aortic regurgitation murmurs can be present up to 50% of the time, especially if they're type A. So remember, those are the ascending coming off the heart. And then there may be neurological deficits anywhere from seizure, altered mental status, focal neurological deficits. Um, and that's because if the dissection involves the arch, it can involve um, blood flow to the brain. So it can be showing up as a, as a stroke or potentially transient, um, maybe even questionable to what the and that they may just have anxiety. The risk factors for developing an aortic dissection, it's gonna be hypertension, um, congenital uh, tissue disorders such as Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos. It may be a congenital bicuspid aorta. Um, and there's some other ones too, but those are kind of the more frequent ones or the more common. And then the images on the right before I talk about treatment, the image on the top shows you um, not only the ultrasound, of a normal pericardial, uh, parasternal long axis, but also kind of shows you the anatomy. So it gives you an idea of what you're looking at um, with the RVOT is the right ventricle outflow track. And then the um, AV uh, being the aortic valve, LA left atrium, um, MV mitral valve and LV the left ventricle. And the image on the bottom shows you um, abnormal. So if you kind of compare from the image above to the image below, although the ultrasound images are not um, to scale to each other, but you can see the vast difference in the size of the um, aorta um, outflow, that it's remarkably more wide. And then if you, this may just look like snow TV to you guys, um, to people, but it takes a little bit of looking at um, ultrasounds to kind of get uh, familiarized with what you're looking at, but if you see the positive arrow sign, most times in radiographic images, that's the abnormal, but the positive arrow sign here shows the dissection flap just um, on the, uh, think of it as the um, outflow of the aortic valve. So the dissection flap um, basically kisses or touches the aortic valve as the aortic valves are open in that image. And then treatment is going to be dependent on what type of dissection the patient is um, dealing with. Uh, type A dissection is surgical, so they need a cardiothoracic surger, surgeon immediately, where um, and they also need medical management until they can be repaired emergently. In type B or the descending um, aorta dissections, they're all medical management, so that uh, so both the medical management is 
blood pressure and heart rate reduction and pain control. And um, this is substantial decrease in these vital signs. So to give you a, an idea, um, a lot of times these patients are hypertensive and we're having a goal of systolic blood pressures of 100 and heart rates of 50 or 60. Um, and that's why they're on continuous drips to try to prevent further dissection or rupture. All right, and then reviewing our protocol on um, aspirin, one of the contraindications is any kind of vascular um, catastrophes, uh, as well as if it can't be metabolized um, appropriately. So we all know allergy, we know, um, and maybe we don't, maybe a good point to remember is that um, history of bleeding disorder. So any of your hemophiliacs or potentially even your von Willebrand uh, disease patients, we don't want to be giving aspirin to or at least consulting medical control. And then anyone actively bleeding or we think are at risk of having an active bleed um, in the near future. Any questions about case four? All right. Oh, yeah, okay. there's there's one question in here, Jackie, real quick. Um, does five to 30 cases per million refer to the general population or the population that presents with ACS signs and symptoms? Um, I'll, I, mean, I believe that it's the general population, but was this the ACS case? Yeah, that's general population. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you. So. You able to hear me in it finally now? Yes. Oh, good. Well, I guess I guess you answered me. Yes. <laughs> I had an I had I had made a comment, but I couldn't uh, on the other case, which the other aspirin case, which uh, I noticed that they they very astutely put down that the patient had um, um, delayed capillary refill, which I thought was a good pick and then was actually below the only recorded blood pressure i saw was below 100 and i think this might have been a good case to stand back and maybe think about not giving aspirin but also try a little fluid challenge to see what would happen to her yeah that's a good point i was having trouble with my uh speaker i had sent a number of things in there such as that, that yes, we will try to find out why that uh, case got got diverted to Portland, whether they actually made contact or they were just going on the on the information from Cressa. Gotcha. Um, and then what I'll do here is um, I unfortunately with this uh with this program was unable to put the um, images, the videos that I wanted to, but this is of our 39 year old. And you kind of looking, here, let me start over. So um, here's his heart and here's his aorta. Um, this is a CT angiogram. And what you're gonna be looking at once I start this is that uh, it'll look like um, there's two snakes or two aortas. So kind of watch as we scroll through. And it'll be a little easier. You can see right there. So that's his dissection with two flaps for his aorta. And you can kind of see it all the way down here um, as it goes down to his descendings. All right. Um, let's see here. Now, case five. is of a 72 year old male who um, EMS was contacted on um, by the behalf of the patient's roommate. The patient um, actually had relatively no complaints, but his roommate had noted that he had some chest pain and had been complaining about chest pain um, for about two weeks. And I'm gonna stop going to the HPI and talk to a little bit about the, pre um, the other sections of this slide. PPE was appropriate for the level of uh, exposure that the patient and the providers had with them. 
his airway, he was awake, uh, alert, and oriented, um, probably at his baseline, which seemed like a cognitive de delay. His airway is open. He was protecting. His pulse was present. There was no abnormalities on skin assessment. Uh, initial vital signs noted that they were all actually within normal limits. The patient didn't know about his history, despite his age should be that he would know about it. And then uh, in further investigation, it sounds like most of it coming from the roommate was that he's been complaining of left-sided chest pain for two weeks, that apparently it was worse today. He almost passed out when he was walking, and that when this was attempted to be corroborated by the patient himself, he basically said, I don't know, I can't read or write, I don't pay attention to things. And that's actually um, the information that was documented in the uh, pre-hospital electronic medical record, which I think that it's pertinent to the fact that we're not able to get much history from a, from this patient. So vital signs were obtained within a few minutes of making patient contact. He had an IV um, established, he had a blood glucose checked, and he had a 12 lead obtained. He was given a full dose aspirin and he was transported. Another set of vital signs were obtained. And, and you know, I'm not sure what but his heart rate went up a little bit, but he already started in the 90s, so it wasn't like there was a big change, and he arrives to the hospital where I take care of him. Uh, this is his 12 lead. He has some ectopy. Uh, obviously, it doesn't appear to be a totally normal-looking EKG, especially based on the in the uh, precordial leads, but otherwise, it's sinus tack, at least as it's recorded by our life pack here at a rate of a 111 in that he has a right axis deviation as well as a right bundle branch block. So I thought that pre-hospital care, the parts that really ex were great was that the documentation was good. The documentation was good about why you got called and uh, the fact that the patient was unable to provide any history and why the patient was unable to provide the history by documenting the, the statements that the patient had. A complete differential diagnosis was assessed where I think that other providers that were maybe less astute would have maybe start an IV or maybe just do a 12 lead and say, well, he can't really tell me about what's going on, so I'm not going to give him anything, which me, you know, if you document that you didn't because you can't confirm that he's not actively bleeding, I think that's reasonable and that they did a good job of uh, working up and treating chest pain, even if the patient was not exactly the most forthcoming. The 12 lead for uh, EKG obtainment from patient contact was a room for improvement. So in the emergency room, the patient continued to be a very poor historian. He reported that he, yeah, he might have had some chest pain, especially he had unilateral leg swelling. I asked him if this was his baseline. He was uncertain if he's ever had leg swelling or if even if he had leg swelling presently. Uh, based off of his nonspecific complaints and his physical exam findings, I worked him up for uh, a thrombosis, both with a venous ultrasound and with uh, cardiac enzymes, as well as a CTPE study which he ended up having not only a DVT, but he also had a saddle PE with evidence of heart strain and a significantly elevated troponin. Normally we look at troponins and we look at them um, being positive if they're greater than 0 0.04. So a value of three is grossly positive. Despite having this extensive clot burden with heart strain, his vital signs were really stable. He never required supplemental oxygen. Uh, we discussed this case with the the rest of the the inpatient team, ICU team with um, ICU and with interventional radiology. And they, at that point, given how stable he appeared and was, they asked to just start at that time. We usually consult them to determine if we need to give TPA or not. Um, in the in the hospital, he ended up having an IVC filter placed, and most likely based off. Uh, delay and concern for concern for compliance with anticoagulation on the long-term basis. And while they were having the IVC filter placed, they directed um, TPA through a catheter at his uh, clot. And then hopefully you guys can see this. So this is of that patient. Let me get back to the beginning of it. 
And what you're looking at is the axial view um, from head down to the feet. So we're looking at the at the more proximal caudal or more proximal as we go through the images it'll be running down towards the feet uh this year well i'll show you oh let me make the noise stop so your pulmonary arteries are coming up in this and you can see that they're not fully um, contrast loaded they're not that's all clot bird in there so your right pulmonary artery is full of clot um, so representing his saddle PE. Sorry about it, a little bumpy. So uh, quick talk about pulmonary embolisms. Um, I'm running a little bit late, so I'll try to not take too long for it. So PEs are thrombuses that become lodged in the artery of the lung and impedes blood flow. They usually come from the venous system of the legs although they can also come from the pelvis, upper extremities, the renal um, vasculature, or even the right chamber of the heart, such as like a uh, post-MI. Um, post he, the respiratory consequences for a PE usually is related to the increased alveolar dead space, the hypoxemia, and the hyperventilation, where the hemodynamic consequences is, um, is, recognized by the increase in right ventricular afterload, and if significant enough, it could lead to right heart failure, uh, which represents as shortness of breath pulmonary edema. Risk factors for PE are represented here in Virchow's triad. So either reduced blood flow from AFib, long stasis, immobility, increased coagulability, either by congenital factors, such as like factor V Leiden or C or CRS um, deficiency or from uh, nicotine dependence or malignancy and then some type of injury or trauma. So you kind of think of it as like a Venn diagram where you have blood vessel injury, reduced blood flow, increased coagulability, and if they all meet in the center, that represents your uh, likely of developing a thrombus. This occurs in one in a thousand persons per year in the United States data or data. And that this was a little bit, um, I don't know if Dr. Whitwer or anyone else can speak to this, but this was a little bit alarming to me in my research for this lecture that um, a PE is present in up to 80% of patients that present with a DVT. And what's even more concerning or scary is that they may be asymptomatic regarding their PE. So hopefully it's just more of like a subsegmental small PE. But nonetheless, um, this tends to be in, in patients that are less than 55 years old, more predominant in females than males, in patients that are older than 55, more predominant in males over females, in that there is a predilection of uh, PEs occurring more frequently in blacks than white um, patients. So what can I tell you about how do you identify a PE? they are hard. Sometimes they present with classic presentation symptoms and uh, findings such as pleuritic chest pain, shortness of breath, and hypoxia, although that's pretty rare and unfortunately not um, as often that they aren't delivered up on a plate for a uh, diagnosis. They can have no obvious symptoms. They can present with weird symptoms like a seizure, um, a cough. Uh, a seizure is the weird symptom. They might have syncope, cough, hemoptysis, flank pain, uh, flank pain from um, from a thrombus uh, flicking up and causing maybe a renal infarct or something along those lines, or that the clot is big enough that it causes a lung infarct, causing hemoptysis. They might have a decreased level of consciousness, fever, abdominal pain, new AFib. I will tell you that being a predominantly night provider in my um, previous career before coming to you guys, that patients that get up to go use the restroom in the middle of the night, especially the elderly that have a sinkhole episode, uh, frequently they have a, um, a significant PE. Physical exam findings, they're more frequently than not going to be tachypnic. There may be some RALS that you're going to see tachycardia. You know, everyone says S1, Q3, T3. If you see tachycardia, that that is a much more sensitive um, finding for concern to for PE, um, PE presentation or PE diagnosis. 
Fevers are present up to 43% in that you may see lower extremity edema and up to 24% as well as diaphoresis and cyanosis. The pre-hospital care, because I think that that's what we really want to know is that once we suspect it, what can we do? Get a 12 lead. This, you know, we work them up kind of similar to cardiac or pulmonary. Um, you should get a pulse ox, IV, uh, per, peripheral IV. We may or may not give them IV fluids. If you're dealing with somebody that is hypotensive, maybe a little fluid bolus might be helpful, like 250, um, just because you don't want to volume overload an already right heart, right heart failure patient. Um, if they're wheezing, give them bronchodilators, uh, reassess their vital signs, and manage their airway. In the hospital, for us, we have anticoagulation um, via heparin or um, any of our Lovenox, depending on, uh, actually, that'd be more for your DVT patients, but we have anticoagulation that can be given uh, continuously in an IV or as a shot or a pill, and then thrombolytic therapy that's catheter-directed. Uh, we support their hemodynamics and respiratory function just as much as our pre-hospital colleagues do. And then um, IVC, IVC filters. I think that this is good to recognize, especially if your patient says, oh, yeah, I've had a previous IVC filter. An IVC filter is given or placed for anybody, one, who has failed outpatient therapy, either that they were compliant and they still are developing clots and they want to protect their lungs from getting um, a saddle PE or a PE, or two, they're considered too high risk to be anticoagulated. So maybe your patient um, that you go on the nursing home is 70 years old and uh, has a history of thrombosis um, in the L7 IVC filter. They're concerned that starting on the anticoagulation uh, is too risky based off of their frequent falls or that they're not an IVC filters placed in someone who just can't be reliable to take anticoagulation. So in looking at our uh, protocols regarding PE, I found it three places that specifically talked about PEs that I thought might be worth mentioning, and that's in cardiac arrest, if they have a PE, um, like an, in, in asystole and PEA, if you consider a PE as possibly present, you can consider transport. Syncope, a PE is considered a high-risk cause, rightfully so. And respiratory differential diagnosis of tachypnea, especially when everything else um, pans out as unremarkable. All right, home stretch. So chest pain, differential diagnosis is wide. We're represented in these five um, cases. The importance of the physical exam, we talked about that from, you know, concern for dissection, concern for PE, concern for GI bleed. Um, ACS has three categories. They're not all STEMIs. So you're looking for unstable angina and identifying it and getting those patients to the hospital as well as in STEMIs and STEMIs. The importance of 12 leads that are repeated or serial, uh, as we talked about in case three, where the initial 12 lead concerning and scary, where the subsequent one 10 minutes later really was not all that impressive. And then ensure that the treatment we're giving, that we're not um, inadvertently hurting them. So making sure, my, in my practice myself, especially because we had um, some of these similar presentations in my uh, fellowship, where people were unfortunately um, getting having a GI bleed was that I myself now ask people specifically, not only are you allergic, but are you having any vomiting or pooping blood or dark stools? Um, and that might be, and so I document that in my own electronic medical record, that might be something worthwhile for our crews to do. And then lastly is in the Washington Key Performance Indicators. There's six of them specifically for ACS, either ACS slash STEMI. So the look, and this is something that I think that uh, if you're not already aware of it, you should be because we are now honing in, maybe we were honing in before, but now it's my job to hone in on ACS and STEMIs and that we're meeting the criteria that the state would like us to meet. So anybody who's over, 30, over the age of 35 or is 35 that you think are having suspected cardiac chest pain or discomfort from an ACS condition, these are the six things that we're looking at, and you can see that the state would like us to do this 90% of the time or better. So aspirin by EMS, and if they've taken it by the patient prior to our arrival, we just document it, or if we if it's contraindicated, we document it so that we fall into 90% um, success. 12 lead obtainment at any point during your chest pain patient. 
12 lead obtained within less than 10 minutes of initial arrival by EMS. Um, Dr. Whitmer, can you speak to what uh, Clark County MPD's office has dictated? Is it going to be based off of um, AMR's arrival or by the first 12 lead EKG equipped EMS unit, including fire? I will um, give interrupt can, it when can, go ahead. Can you, somehow I got onto an entirely different thing here. I, I'm not seeing your slide set right now, but yes, it is. It's the first it because because literally all of our uh, first responders uh, essentially have uh, have 12 lead capability, so it's the first. You know, it's it's the time of the first arriving um, first responder capable of 12 lead. Good, thank you. And then in the future, they may also have a KPI for serial 12 leads. And, you know, a couple of these cases ourselves just uh, just now showed the importance of serial 12 leads. Anybody that is um, concerned for possible ACS should have less than a 20 minute scene time Although the KPI says it may, you know, individual MPD's offices may make this only for STEMIs. Uh, Dr. Whitwer, what is the our, our stance on 20 minute seating times? All concern for cardiac chest pain or just STEMIs? No, it'll be for all ACS. So if you if if you have a concern for uh, that this is possibly cardiac chest pain you need to have you need to have a 12 lead that's that's pretty straightforward and, simple. and you need to be off scene for in ideally less than 20 20 minutes on scene 90 percent of the time yes. is that right okay. that's true. protocol Perfect. currently is 15 minutes for STEMI that's what protocol indicates right now just to specifically answer that clear that that KPI question um, it's STEMI patient on scene less than 15, 15 minutes or less. The, so the, the state KPI move uh, the, by by acclim. You have to realize that some of this is a political was, was politically decided, not medically decided. Uh, and for some of the um, larger um, uh, fire based transport companies, they uh, they said we can't we can't do a 15 minute thing, so they they moved it out to 20. Although the standard from American Heart is still uh, 15. Okay. And the so then, standard, the standard we're, we're looking at 15 on our thing. We 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 can always exceed the state KPIs. We can even add more KPIs to our and so for. In the future, when we finally get this system down um, uh, cold, uh, I would want to add serial 12 leads to the to the uh, KPI. All right, perfect. Thank you guys for your um, additional knowledge. And last two uh, points of our current KPIs for ACS patients is that. Um, we want to recognize that STEMI patients that are determined to be code STEMI are activated prior to hospital arrival greater than or equal to 90% of the time, and that the percent of patients identified as a STEMI by EMS are taken to the designated cardiac uh, receiving center, which I think that these are done pretty consistently. But so be aware, we want to document giving aspirin or that you didn't give aspirin for what reason. 12 lead obtainment needs to be obtained, which I think we do a pretty good job. I'd say actually really good job, but where we really need to be improving is getting those 12 leads done within the first 10 minutes for chest pain patients to evaluate if they're a STEMI and to also um, figure out what kind of issue you're dealing with on that 12 lead. Correct. All right. And then, um, as always, you can contact me, but I want to point out that this is the email I'd like for uh, future correspondences. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, what's the words? It
you can send me um, patient specifics. It won't be leaked into um, the World Wide Web, so it's protected. So please use this email when you're trying to reach out to me to ensure that we keep the information that we're relating private and not uh, not discoverable um, by hackers or whatnot. And that and that's true for all of the uh, MPD uh, assistants and the MPD. <laughs> yeah. Use I our think use, use our ClarkMPD.org. And last name. Right. Awesome. Well, I apologize for going over. I hope that it was beneficial. Um, you know, this was a little bit heavy on cardiac, but I think that there's been some great cases that I've either read about or been involved with. And um, again, if you don't want to see a lot of RSI or chest pain or whatnot, send me some cases so that I can uh, take the moment to point out learning points or a job well done. Anyone have any questions or concerns? Thanks, Jackie. Good presentation. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, now you probably need to get some sleep. Yes. Yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right. Yes. All right. Bye.